Um, so it's it's three thirty. So for those of you who are online with us, we will uh, start the session. We're still waiting for many of our audience. If we're going to have any uh, come here, um, actually at the uh, the room at RMIT, um, but there are some of us in the room, and so. Um, I'd like to, to start the session by just acknowledging the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land uh, we're very fortunate to be here at RMIT today. Um, and so maybe without further ado, we'll head off with our first of our speakers, um, and that is Nobuhiro Asagawa, and he's from Meiji uh, University in Japan. And so I'll turn over to you, Nobuhiro. Thank you for your introduction. It is a great honor to be able to speak to you today. Today I'd like to talk about user participation in, in the design process by Japanese house builders. Here is the outline of my presentation. So I'd like to start by talking about the historical transition of housing products by house builders in Japan. After World War II, housing was in short supply in Japan, and industrialized technology was used to produce a large supply of housing. The first industrialized houses were very cheap and had a few variations. However, through various subsequent efforts, they have realized the design of many variations of a house by combining several parts of a variations. Now, as the lifestyle is shifted to urban areas and users' demands changes, the product changed to higher rise multifunctional houses. This was a brief history of house builders in Japan. To put it simply, the characteristic of the housing production system by house builders in Japan is mass customization. The house builder, house builder packages the conceptual housing product based on the needs of the user. The product includes several options for plans, finishes, and etc. as a standard specifications. The user can customize a combination of these options to design a home that meets his needs. The exchange takes place during several design meetings with sales staff, and the user can learn about these variations through catalogs and drawings. Note that users can only customize. Uh, here is here it is uh, important to note that. Users can only customize freely within the standard specifications. They cannot customize anything that deviates from the standard specifications. This is an example of silent house builders housing in urban. Compared to the first houses by house builders, the sites are smaller, more expensive and high-rise with multiple functions such as uh, rental units and commercial stores in addition to users' residence. What this indicated is that users' requirements are becoming more complex and there is a growing demand for customization beyond the scope of standard specifications. Therefore, the following objects were established for this study. To point at the issue of customization that deviates from the standard specifications and to identify how collaboration with architects can help users to participate in the design process to customize that. So we analyzed the project that house builder, house builder collaborate with architects and made some customization that deviates from the standard specifications. Before we get into the specific analysis, I'd like to show you the relations to the theory of open building. Here you can see the figure that shows positioning in the level of users. What are the differences between these figures? 
I'd like to emphasize that house builders systems limit the users' access to level by standard specifications. The main focus of this study is a red arrow in figure three. What problems do users encounter when customizing furniture and infill levels without being limited to standard specifications? And how does the architect's, architect's profession assist the user? In the next slide, I will introduce an overview of our research. First, this is an overview of the cases we researched. This is a case study of an apartment complex in Tokyo by Company X. Its features include a owner house on the top floor and a rental units on the middle floor, as well as a co-working space and a shared kitchen space on the lower floor. Because this, this species is were not part of the standard specifications for Company X, this case was done in collaboration with architects who do not participate in Company X's work. This slide shows a special person in this case who was involved in the design process. Architects from design firms and such, such manufacturer designers participated in the design process to assist with user customization. This slide shows the design process we recorded. At first, the house builder proposed the design proposal that would fit into the standard specifications. Then, through the collaboration of the people I just mentioned, customization was done. Some of these customizations included deviate from the standard specifications. Let me show you a few examples. The facade, which is a, an entrance to the co-working space, has a large opening and custom-made sashes. Several verandas are fitted with custom-made railings. We analyzed how these customizations were made. This slide shows an overview of the analysis process. We recorded conversations at design meetings and used text analysis method. We recorded 33 hours of conversations from a total of 40 meetings and transcripted them by each utterance. The total number of utterance was 40,845, of which uh, 40,558 were related to design changes. From the content of these utterance, we have organized the design change items and organized each item into categories. There were a total of 107 change items, which were grouped into 34 subcategories and eight categories. The next step was to classify whether these items fit within the standard specifications. In this slide, I will show you the definitions of the change, change items that fit within the scope of the standard specifications or that deviate from them. Their percentages in each category are shown in the table below. As shown here, we can see that changes in various categories were made that deviate from the standard specifications. We use text analysis analysis techniques to investigate these classifications. We calculate for two main methods. The following slide shows the result of the analysis, and today's, today's presentations will be regarding the results of the analysis using the topically of the document, DP. What does uh, utterance with high DT point mean. The answer is that those utterance were important in the exchange, exchange regarding the customization of each subcategory. 
In other words, a person who speaks a lot of highly DT points utterance has a higher impact on the customization of that subcategory. So, for each subcategory, we will graph and discuss the cumulative evolution of the DT points of each utterance. This graph shows the change in DT points for each participant in each subcategory. The figure on the left shows the items changed that, changed that if it is in the standard specifications, and the figure on the right shows items that deviate from the standard specifications. Let's look at the plan categories. For the planning related to the during units, we see that company X and the architect have high points and the user has low points. This indicates that the users were not very involved in the consultation of this item, but instead, instead the, architects, the architects were committed to it. The high user points in the planning of the shared space indicate that users were able to commit to the consultation on this item. At the same time, the high points for the architects were predictive of the importance of the architect's presence to the user's participation. The next graph concerns structure categories. In the left figure, we can see that company X is the highest point in the consideration regarding pillars and beams. This item proved too difficult for other participants to commit to. In the figure on the right, the consideration of the components of the second floor, we see that the user's points are low. However, the architect's points are higher than in the figure, figure of the left. This suggests that the architect's, presen architect's presence was important in these discussions of this item. Next, uh, here is a graph regarding the external fittings category, which is uh, related to windows and sashes. The user's point is low in the discussion of window placement in the left figure. However, if we look at the middle of the diagram, we see a timing where the participant points are rising at the same time. We can read that significant consideration was given at this time. The fact that the user's, po user's points also increased at the same time indicates that they were able to participate in the critical timing on the consultation for this item. In the figure on the right, regarding manufactured sashes, the user has close to zero points. We find that the user was unable to commit to the consideration of this item. However, the architect's, architect's high points in, indicate the importance of the architect in the consideration of this item. So I'd like to summarize the main findings of this study. First, user customization, which deviates from the standard specifications, has difficult uh, has different, different levels of user participation, difficulty for different items. Especially these discussions that require a high level of ex expertise, such as the changes to the skeleton or a topic related to regulation and performance. Secondly, the existence of the architects were found to be effective in assisting user participations. Since this study is only a survey of one case study, the result is, results of this analysis cannot be easily generalized. More case studies should be conducted in the future. That is all my presentation. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Nobuhiro. Um, so we have someone manning the computers. Um, if anyone wants to send questions through the chat, 
Um, and so, Anne, have we got any questions through? No, no questions through yet. We'll, I think, since we may have a little bit of time, um, have a one or two questions possibly straight after each pre presentation and then hopefully have some time at the end. So if you think of a question, please put it into the chat. Um, Noble here, maybe I'll have one question if I can. I'm, I'm kind of curious. The uh, set of standardised designs um, that you can choose from without having to, to customise, how extensive are they in terms of user groups? But which are there options I can take if I'm an older person or if I need to use a wheelchair? Are there standard options for those or they always have to be customised? Once more, sorry. So with the standardised plans, that, okay, are there standardised plans for people who are older, say in their 80s, or if a user needs to use a wheelchair or has a child who needs a wheelchair, can I choose from the standard plans or do I have to customise my house in that, that circumstance, typically in Japan? Maybe. Uh, normal, ha normal housing is a... Uh, with an uh, architect or uh, uh, another provider of house, house, housing can user can free planning to design he wants but uh, house builders projects usually uh, limited user to choice the planning Freedom. So this case study is uh, that point is a uh, main big uh, changes for another project. But this is the only only case study in case study. So another project is not like this case. But in the future in Japan. Like in this case, maybe users' needs is a uh, increase will increase. I think. <laughs> can I? Can I? I just asked because here in Australia, up until well, it hasn't happened yet. It's it's meant to happen in the next twelve months. Uh, standard houses do not come suitable for people who are older or who have a disability. So, it, it, we're still working through that process here. Um, do we have Peng Li, our second presenter, online? Hello, I'm here. Hi, Peng Good Li. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Excellent. I'll um, hand you over to our technicians. So if you want to share your screen and um, and start your presentation, it'd be great. Sure. I have the pre-record videos here so I can play it. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. I don't actually have a copy of it, so if you could, that'd be great. Sure. Just don't forget to share the audio. Have you seen my screen? Please. Yep. I'll just move it across. Hello, my name is Tom Bingy. It is not okay, right? Audio. My research topic is the survey of developing apartment shop houses condition for the future housing adaptability and revitalization in Phnom Penh. By improving the living condition, Phnom Penh hopes to become one of the most livable and sustainable city. However, the new living uh, developments such as high-rise apartments, townhouses have ignored the neighborhood living, existing living conditions, such as makes use and dance and cause the urban gentrification as well. Is all this problem address the opportunity for persuading living condition, living design solution according to the policies, people preferences, and the pain points of the existing housing design. Let me briefly introduce briefly about the apartment shop houses in the Phnom Penh, which is uh, adopted from the Western architectural modernism combined with traditional shop house. In other way, the apartment shop house is a mixed urban design solution that combines commercial and residential. These are the traditional shop houses 
but in a form of the multi-story concrete apartment building with the commercial usage on the ground level and as well as divide to uh, different unit ownership to in each of the upper floor. All this is uh, show that uh, show that the apartment shop house in Phnom Penh features openness, the flexibilities and adaptabilities, and all the elements of this structural system make it independent from one another, providing the apartment shop house in Phnom Penh with a very open using system. So it is pretty similar to the open building principle. And inspired by Jane Jacob books, uh, The Death and Life of the Great American City, uh, a successful neighborhood should consist of the four main issues, sites, uh, primary program, small block, area building diversity, population density. So by reviewing all the character of the apartment shop house, uh, block and as well as the unit, uh, it's like many old town, the characteristic of it is clearly understood from the local residents. I guess the market, because of uh, many program and, and the apartment shop have a lot of also small and close to one another because of the walkability. And the development of the city can also be seen from the various uh, period age of the building, especially the apartment shop house, which is from the traditional shop house into the apartment building shop house. Uh, it is a good example of the diversity and the residential unit and activities and showing the density. So all these characteristics of the apartment shop house support all the four requirements of the jungle plan gear on promoting the wearable and the livable city. So, and this study is aimed to investigate it. The current conditions, apartment shop house, and the unit owner requirement in terms of their living space, as well as how the owner manage this special layout, and in to to enhance the quality of the apartment shop house, adopting the open building approach. For collecting the useful information about the apartment shop house and understand how the resident use and adapt the units. Uh, the survey of the 40 apartment shop houses unit was conducted within which are uh, the, the area that's selected are inside the center, the city center of Phnom Penh City. The majority of the apartment shop house, so houses survey are located close to very known market and many commercial activities. And this is due to the influence of the Chinese shop house that are always found in the commercial area. And after that, uh, the apartment shop house unit was surveyed by sketching, me measurement with the photographing to know the unit size and uh, to see the con existing conditions of the unit. And also the question in the Google form was created to uh, the unit owner and ask them about their basic information, the current state of the unit and the current state of the apartment shop house block as well. And in addition, the 10 unit owners interview were conducted in order to have a better understanding of the apartment shop houses unit and the blocks environment, as well as some of the issues that I experienced inside the unit. Uh, this is the result from one of the, uh, so one of the unit owner that uh, showing the plans, the section drawing, the survey and some photograph of the unit and showing the uh, program inside. So the result uh, or the reason to live in the apartment shop house unit, and there are four major reasons for living in the apartment shop house, according to the survey. For example, like the first one is close to the other facility, stay, and the second is stay close to the relative or family and an affordable opportunity for uh, the other business. And this is the method that they are used for renovate their unit. And this is the three major methods that use for renovation. Like to repaint the interior space, uh, they want to save the money, so they don't want to uh, renovate a lot, just repaint it to make it look new. And at addition the mezzanine, so this is based on uh, the second point, the addition of the mezzanine and also the party install more partition for to get more room. It's depend on the member of the, that living inside the unit. 
And there are some technical components as well, component consent as well for renovating their, uh, their unit. So this is the four major technical component constraints according to the survey, like the pipe and the wire. Um, uh, the second one is the wall share with the other units and the floor slab, the internal vault inside. And for the daylight quality inside the unit, uh, there are three space that uh, it's sufficient the natural daylight cannot get through, get, get enough. Like, for example, the first one is the kitchen, the second is the bathroom and the living room. And because of that problem and that constraint, so uh, the unit owner think that the unit that they live nowadays is not based on their lifestyle pre preferences. Uh, and as well as the use of the pedestrian, the alleyway and the common staircase, as the storefront, the full store, and there are people are coming to sell the product on that. So uh, it's caused the block uh, being negative. Uh, for the daylight, the apartment shop have blocked uh, because of the alleyway they've been using by the unit owner and they adding more, more structure on it. So it caused the daylight is very, some of the, the block is very poor and as well as the hygiene because uh, there are some commercial activities that used by the unit owner and uh, because it is the common space that people don't uh, care that might so it costs the hygiene of their some of the space very poor uh, for the result of the interview there are four main issues for the apartment shop house it's unit like for example the first one the adaptability over time so it's like their lifestyle change and it to evolve but the current shop house unit are involved in response to their social change. Uh, and as well as the second one is the technical structural constraint. So it is not easy to access, to maintain, to modify or installation the technical component. So because of that technical and the structural constraint, it limits the space arrangement design of the current apartment shop house, uh, which is flexible enough to allow for the future potential expansion and the future special modifications. And the last thing is the budget is always a challenging. So to be renovated it costs a lot. And this is the result for the uh, for the interview of the apartment shop house block. So there are six main concerns, for example, like the parking space, the public space, the like of the green space, the pedestrian, and the alleyway conditions, common staircase and the waste management. Inclusion from the result of the survey questionnaires and interview. Uh, Residents now expect their yeah, unit to be more flexible regarding to the composition of their families and lifestyle that change along with the passage of the times. And the residents now expect to get more design foundations of the building that allow more for potential expansion and extra load with more than the minimum special areas as well as the floor heights than the uh, current dimension of the unit to facilitate space adaptations, other function and uh, other conditions. And it is important to look at strategically the table, ducts and pipes, separate flexible component from inflexible one, make it easier to, man to maintain and repair. And for the apartment shop house blocks, uh, it needs to be improved the existing uh, conditions. Keep a strong center community, good neighborhood, more public space and parking space, and rearrange the uh, waste management to support the change of idea on promoting the diversity of the place. Uh, the last one is the, the need for the buffer zone for the block, which is allowed to be well organized, overflowing, caused by the frequent change of the space and the blocks, and to avoid any expect from the other expanded from the other space. And the buffer space should have their own function, which is changed according to the need. Thank you. Thank you, Peng Presentation. Um, thank you, Peng Did anyone have any questions? No, no questions coming through online yet. Um, yes, Peng I Lee, have. Oh, you have? Um, please go ahead. If I allow, yes, I'm interested in this paper very much uh, because I have uh, uh, visited V9 several times. I understand the traditional shop house, which you have a shop in the front, 
people living behind or above. Very clear. But yours is apartment shop house. I wonder how these things come out. Who is the owner? Who is the builder? And how they divided the the, the uh, space afterwards? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is the apartment shop house because it's like uh, it it's fire from the traditional shop house. Like because the traditional shop house only have two stories. Let's say so right now because in that time in the modernism uh, movement so they try to combine with the local materials like just concrete so they can expand it to more floor more story and so uh, they keep the the function is still the same and the ground floor as the commercial use and the upper floor as the uh, resident unit but right now some of them ha has renovated some of the uh, the upper floor units to be like example in the picture that i show you to be like uh, the office uh the school uh, a small very small classroom for teaching some uh small amount of the students something like this and for the access they have the common staircase in the middle of the uh, of the apartment so they can separate into and get into each of the unit Am I answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peng Li, I have a question here from uh, one of your next door neighbors. Uh, hi, my name is Anne. I'm from Messi University, but I'm uh, original come from Vietnam. So we do oh. have the shop how kind of traditional shop how uh, similarly, and we done a research about it a um, few years ago. And one of the challenge when people want to live in the shop how despite of it conditional and despite of many things inconvenient is the land value of the shop how you know the land value so it's very expensive um, yeah to buy a land in in the center of the city so do you sure. consider the land value is a challenge when you yeah. uh, do the ad adaptive review of the shop how yep thank you Thank you. That is one of the challenges as well, because yeah, we see in the development development of the, of the city, the city, uh, the price at the center of the city is very, you know, uh, is very expensive, just like you said. Uh, but the thing is, uh, we try to encourage people because that is the evolution of the shop house that we still have. Maybe yeah, I've been visit to Ho Chi Minh City as well. I saw the apartment uh, coffee. Uh, they very, you know, uh, uh, arranged. The building is very nice. So I think that case uh, uh the fry is in is, is is one hand but we have to keep this kind of uh, that that uh typology of the shop how to be uh it still uh exists something like this am i answer your questions yes i'm getting a nod <laughs> um so Thank you, Peng Lee. Um, if anyone else has a question, please throw it into the chat. And if we've got some time left at the end, then we can um, can come to them. Uh, in the meantime, have we got Shan Chen? Is, are they there ready? Shall, shall we maybe start the presentation? Just bear with us one second. We're just getting Shan Chen's presentation ready. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to be here to share our research with all of you. My topic today is study of the hierarchical relationships and renovation of support system in existing residential areas in Shenzhen, China. I'm Chen Shen from Shenzhen University, China. And my collaborators are Professor Fan Yue and Assistant Professor Zhang Chung. After more than 40 years of urbanization, the level of urban residential building construction in China has rapidly improved. Shenzhen, a city that developed after China's economy reform in 1978, has transformed from an agricultural-based rural society into an industry-based modern city. By the beginning of 2020, 
there were approximately 1,600 existing residential areas were built before 2000, accounting for 32% of the total. After these years of use, the structures in these settlements have experienced different degrees of de deterioration. Shenzhen has engaged in a diversified transformation to maintain and renew old residential area. However, there has been a lack of systematic review of different renovation practices and their effect on existing residential area. Based on your opinion and American experience, open building theory has applied in Japan to guide building construction and revolutions. In China, the earliest practice of developing support housing was in Wuxi. In recent years, many researchers have addressed the idea of level from open building theory and have made progress in both research and practice. Based on the concept of level, our research reviews the hierarchical relationships in existing residential area in Shenzhen, discusses the current renovation approaches, and summarizes the methods focusing on support systems. While the concept of level is the central idea of open building, there are three separate but coordinated hierarchical levels, the tissue, the support, and infill. According to the state of existing housing in Shenzhen, the residential buildings are divided into three levels, addressing four main parts, the outdoor environment, structure, interface, and indoor environment. Renovation practice for existing housing in China mainly adjusts the support level, accounting for more than 60 of renovations. In our research, the support level is expanding to include four main parts, the bearings and enclosure structures, component attached to the facade, public space in the building, and the public pipeline. Well, you can see from the table, um, the main renovations and corresponding levels of existing residential areas in Shenzhen. We can see there are several renovation types like comprehensive improvement, facade improvement, and elevator installations, and so on. It can be seen that most of the renovation practice in Shenzhen involves the support level. To understand the revolution method and efforts in existing residential areas in Shenzhen, nine typical cases were selected. These residences are mainly multi-story brick concrete residential buildings and have undergone different degrees of revolution. Our study methods included field investigation, observation, and interviews. Topic areas for the research included the mood of transformation, degree of renovation impact, rights and responsibilities of residential subjects, and purpose of transformation of different aspects of support system. And then we summarize the renovation method of different parts. First is the facade. The building facade renovation include cleaning, painting, renovation of the old vertical facade, and so on. In our cases, the facade of Ho Hai Garden was updated in a redesigned way, and we can see from the picture that after comprehensive improvement, all the colors of the facade were changed and all the air conditioner units were arranged. But in the cases of Lianhua North Village and other cases, 
only underwent painting on the facade of some building along the street roof. There are current few government lead roof reconstruction projects in old residential areas. In the investigation cases, only Xinjo Garden has conducted roof renovation and energy saving coatings. Windows and balcony. Balconies and windows have mainly been renovated by flat residents. The community has been used for more than 30 years, and residents have a strong interest in reconsideration. In the new round of decoration, residents have replaced the window frame, balcony frame, and empty felt net. A lack of property management and guidance has led to many changes in the size and shape of window openings and balcony modeling decorations. Components attached to the facade mainly include air conditioner stands, anti theft nets, and shade facilities. The air conditioner stands in some residential areas have been redesigned as part of comprehensive improvements. In our research, we found that 90% of the residents have installed anti theft nets. Public space in the building. Public space in the building um, is mainly needed by governments as part of comprehensive improvements. While most existing residential buildings are multi stories and are not encrypted with elevators, installing elevators in joining funding by building residents and the government, with government subsidized provide 50% of the funding. And, and then it's not an easy way to installing elevators. And we can see from the picture that in Yitian village, um, only um, few buildings are added with elevators. Public pipeline. Pipeline in existing residential areas have been used for many years, making their aging increasingly common. Half of the cases in the researched residential areas have had their water pipes replaced. Well, um, for our research, we found that there are many diverse type of renovation in the existing residential areas in Shenzhen. A systematic transformation mood has not yet formed for existing residential area. There is no scientific diagnosis for the renewal, but more transformation according to the needs of urban landscape. According to the theory of open building, the level of residential building support should be low to the residents. The renovation of the existing residential area in Shenzhen is mainly supported by the government and apartment residents. With lack of decision making made by the residential building residents, there is often lack of communities between government lead renovation and house lead transformations. Based on the concept of the level, this study analyzes renovation mode, efforts, purpose, and parties responsible for the renovation of support system in existing residential areas. This study provides a new perspective and a theoretical basis for revealing the renovation of existing residential area in China. And that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't think we have um, Shan Chen online with us, so we're unable to ask her any questions. Uh, I'm open if anyone wants to make a comment. 
or otherwise we can move on to our next speaker uh, who is with us online from the University of Tokyo. Uh, it's Ma Lingjiang. Uh, are you there, Ma? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, have we got a copy of the presentation? Do you want us to upload the presentation for you or are you happy to share your screen? Yeah, actually I have some revised, so I'd like to share with you by myself. That's quite all right. Okay, over to you. Okay. So just to wait a minute. So can you see the screen? Yes, we can. So, okay. Hello everyone. Today I'd like to introduce my research of a comparison study on the long life housing development histories and the plans of collective housing based on the open building theory in China and Japan. And uh, I'm going to give the presentation through these contents. Uh, firstly, I'd like to have a brief introduction of that. Uh, in Japan, the housing shortage problem was solved in 1970s. And after that, the government began to focus on improving the quality of housing. In China, the housing shortage problem was not fully solved until 2010s, and the government took measures to restrict the so-called two-time decoration since around 2000 to improve the housing quality. But actually, the uh, effect came out after 2010s. Uh, also, uh, system and uh, methods learned from abroad, like SI system began to be localized in China. And you can see the photos here in that uh, uh, of uh, Japanese cap of the famous Next 21, of the two-time decoration in China, which means that in field totally no in field, totally no in field in, in inside the house, and the residents need to do that by themselves. And this, the famous in China, famous one in China, Vaisai housing of Ya uh, apartment. And uh, the open building theory and the SI housing system are undoubtedly one of the good solutions for the long term use. However, as the cost is high and the standard is strict. The SI system has not been generalized, and some of the designs can't actually meet the, of, uh, the resident's needs, and some functions are not used as those are designed to be. So to solve this problem as the first step, uh, the characteristics of the long life housings in China and Japan, and the differences between them were investigated in this article. And uh, next, I'm going to briefly introduce the development history of long life collective housing in China and Japan. In Japan, there were many systems and uh, projects that developed since 1970s. And before 2000, the experimental long life housing developed a lot. And after 2000, as the technique began to be mature, uh, the laws and acts were implemented or revised. And in China, after which the SIR was introduced, firstly introduced in, in 1980, the long life housing in develop, developed greatly. Uh, in 1985, the first open building housing in China, uh, which was just now mentioned by another speaker, the, 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 the Huifeng Xinchun in Wuxi, uh, was constructed. And the systems and the projects were implemented from 1990 to, 2000, to, to 2010. And after 2010, the projects related to SI and the industrialized techniques began to be widely developed and constructed. So uh, in this part, we made a comparison study between China and Japan on housing plants. And in Japan, Professor Nishiyama proposed the separation of eating and sleeping quarters in small houses, which later became the basic plan form of Japan's public housing, uh, which is the NDK. And after which the NDK was uh, transferred to NLDK in to, uh, in 1960s and became the main platform in 1970s. And in China, there were only one or two rooms in the accommodate housings before to 1980. After 1980, the plan form of NR 
1LD, 1T was proposed, which later became the main platform of NRMLDST, which means that the house has N bedrooms or studies, M dining or and and or living rooms and uh, S toilets. And uh, here are plans and the graph notations of plan network of collective houses, houses in Japan from 1990 to 2005. And this is also once and this the same in China around 2000 built around 2000. This is also and uh, we summarized the plan here uh, and made a comparison. Uh, we found that in Japan, the frame structure is the main structure form and there are there are few structure walls inside the households. Uh, the skeletons and the infuse are often separated. The households are usually arranged at one side of the public corridors. Uh, balconies are usually connected one to another uh, due to the restriction of fire regulations. Functions of the rooms are oriented through the corridor. Uh, water section are usually around the, the middle of the house and the, the interior works are often finished when residents move in move in in most cases. While in China, sheer wall structure is the main structure form and there are usually structural walls inside the households. The households on the same floor usually share one public corridor with the transportation core in the center. Rooms are generally oriented around the living and dining room and uh, there are usually more than one toilet and the bathroom in one household now. Uh, when entering the house, people often see, see first, firstly see the living and dining room and uh, the most dis distinct one. Uh, there are often no infills when residents move in and they need to do the infill works by themselves or uh, looking for the decoration companies at that period. And yeah, and uh, after dozens of uh, attempts, the newly built collective houses in China and Japan seem to be more adaptable to localize the plans, which, which uh, when, when, when the designers use the open building series. You can see the plans here, which are built after 2008 in China and Japan. Uh, in Japan, the plan form doesn't change much, but uh, people tend to pay more attention on flexibility. You can see multiple uh, walls, even kitchen islands can that can be moved easily. And the frame was uh, used by uh, was was using a kind of out frame design, uh, which you can see the frame is a, a little bit outer, uh, a little bit out uh, outside the room and. Uh, we also find the water section is um, concentrated in one place of the house. On the other hand, in China, most of the structure walls are being removed, though uh, there are few movable units that can be found in the households, which means that the flexibility is not the essential one to be considered in the house housing design. Uh, there are double filling, uh, double uh, floorings with the slab sunk in some cases, and the pipe shafts are moved inside the households. Besides the numbers, number of cases that interiors are also finished increases. Uh, to have a discussion in Japan, the SI supply system didn't realize due to the limit on laws though, because the already the already highly developed housing industrialization, the structure was totally separated by skeleton and infill. And uh, so so in Japan, it formed the SI structure system. In China, due to the limitation of research and housing industrialization, the related infill techniques weren't well developed. Uh, besides, as the needs of Chinese residents differ a lot, uh, it is essential to meet residents' needs before they move into a new houses. Uh, mo moreover, due to the long-term lack of uh, industrial 
experiences, people rarely regard big span space as a common method for uh, collective housing. So it is difficult to separate the support and infill on structural level. So through big span and uh, industrialized units. So in China, it formed the SI supply system. And about the flexibility in Japan, the housing shortage problem was gradually solved in since 1970s, and people tend to live tended to live in one house for a long time. So in Japan, uh, flexibility is much more important. Uh, while in China, the development in quick speed is still ongoing. The house market is expanding, and so are the prices. So that the price of old houses tend to rise just like the new house, new ones do. Besides, due to the problems in house management after long term use, the, the environment of communities get worse in many cases. So people tend to find a new house after long time living uh, in China. So in China, long life strategies are only considered for a relative short period when people move in and the flexibility is not the essential one for consideration. Uh, as a conclusion, we compared the development histories and the plans of collective housing in China and Japan and found that uh, Japan formed the SI structure system and China formed the SI supply system. And in China, whether the supply SI supply system should be modified or rather than replacing the SI supply system with uh, SI structure system remains to be discussed. And uh, as uh, recent progress of this research, uh, I mainly focused on the collective housing in China. Uh, I made a lot of investigations in Chinese uh, collective houses, including both long life housings and normal ones. Uh, I'm now analyzing them, trying to find the relationship between the supply systems and the infill results, which means that that uh, I think that I think uh, there, there are some must be some relationship between the supply systems and the interiors. So uh, you can see the photos here of different building methods, different different uh, supply forms and uh, different decision makers. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's all. Thank you. If you have any questions or suggestions or that you want to make a discussion, you can reach me with this email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ling Xiang. Does anybody have the camera? Does anybody have any questions? No, OK, Um, just yes, go Jai. So and thank you, uh, Mr. Ma. A wonderful paper. Yeah, I, I learned a lot from you. I I am interested in the structure and uh, yeah. the actual profit from these uh, structures. Yeah. So I understand Japan has a lot of uh, concrete structure. Yeah? yeah. To frame structure starting very early. Yeah. But I understand that they were not designed for uh, open building kind of yes. flexibilities. Yeah. But do you think uh, in the later uh, renovation stage, this uh, structure really provide a higher potential of uh, change or not? Yeah, actually, actually there, uh, you, you know, Habra can propose, propose the, the, the open building in 1960s, but uh, actually, the same period in the, on the, in the same period in Japan, there are also some series that uh, was same to the open building series, which uh, this is not that uh, how to say uh, not uh, examined it yet. But I, to my opinion, as I'm as my opinion, I think it is uh, related to Japanese tra traditional. Uh, form of uh, actually China's China's also tradition form of the the the, the how to say frame structure of wood. So uh, and uh, when researchers find something that we can use from the traditional form and uh, put it into the 
modern how to say circumstance, uh, they found that they can they can use it. And uh, yeah, it came into the so-called frame structure and uh, uh, more more thing I think uh, as I think is that uh, one more thing as I think is that uh, you know Japan has a lot of earthquake so, and the frame structure is also a good structure for to to to, to avoid the, the damage of the earthquake so uh, it uh, lay led Japan to uh, to 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 build a lot of uh, this kind of uh, con concentrate structure or the frame structure and I think this how to say uh, just uh, in not that obviously but uh, it uh, gradually made Japan's uh, SI system become became more uh, how to say more, more more mature not not that uh, and uh, I think uh, how to say that. Uh, actually, I think this is re related to, to Japanese uh, traditional uh, and uh, Japanese geological uh, things. I think, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I answer your questions. I, I, I'm maybe I should say more, <laughs> but now, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I want to just have a cons consideration and. Uh, Yes, later later on I, we can have a discussion more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ling Zhang. Um, this is more of a, a comment, I guess. Um, I think you're completely correct to point out that the Japanese building industry is quite different to the Chinese building industry. And in fact, all building industries, construction industries are quite different. And even here, um, in Melbourne, we also have had the last 20 years real issues with our particularly high-rise residential apartments with having internalised shear walls, concrete shear walls within our buildings um, that really limit the kind of flexibility to the residents uh, to yep. adapt to those apartments. And that's really a case because the um, decision makers on the structure and the engineering of the building are different from the decision makers um, who actually live in the apartments in the end. And so that, uh, so we have those issues as well um, with uh, internalised shear walls um, and adaptability. Okay, um, so now I get to do my presentation, um, similar to Jai having to present um, and uh, chair the same meeting. So I'll just ask our IT guys to put our things up. Thank you. Ready to go? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> firstly, uh, apologies. This um, this presentation is absolutely not about open buildings. Um, I don't think the conference organisers were quite sure where to put our presentation uh, in the schedule, and so we ended up in open buildings primarily because this is a paper to do with housing um, and and how housing has adapted and changed over the years, and so we felt it was the closest um, fit but it's definitely not a paper on um, open housing. As you can probably see by the title, the title of it is Human Rights, Disability and Construction. And the question we're examining here is how responsive are building regulations to changing community attitudes towards housing for people who have a disability? So the first thing we need to um, acknowledge, I guess, is that yes, building regulations are technical documents and that they contain a lot of technical information, um, but that at its heart, building regulations are social documents. They reflect social attitudes, community attitudes towards a whole range of things, health, safety, expectations of family life, all those things. And so we need to understand that building regulations are really social documents at their heart, as well as technical ones. Those photos on the right, you can see there, they are images of Melbourne um, from the 1800s, um, inner Melbourne, basically where we are here at RMIT at the moment. So you can see the social conditions that people lived in. So what this short 10 minute presentation is going to be about. This opens up a whole range. When you start to talk about building regulations as social documents, it opens up a whole range of things. What we're going to do though, is walk through a history of Australian building regulations 
and a history of community attitudes towards people with a disability in Australia. And we're going to map actually how surprisingly intertwined those two things are. So if we start at the beginning pretty well, um, looking at the 1800s, early 1800s in New South Wales, our first uh, called at the time lunatic asylums um, was at Castle Hill in 1811. It was a recycled army barracks. Um, by about 1826, it was falling apart. And so they um, commandeered another building in Liverpool. And in 1838, the first purpose built um, lunatic asylum in Australia was was built. Um, you can see photos of it on the right. Down the bottom, those bottom two images, their image of um, the lunatic asylum Bedlam in London, all of our um, programmatic uh, and examples for our lunatic asylums came from London. Um, Bedlam was started out in the 1200s in London as the uh, Bethlehem Hospital, and certainly by the 1300s was receiving uh, people with mental health issues, and so it became um, the, the, the standard by which other lunatic asylums were built. So Gladesville, 1838, the first building regulations in Australia were in the Hawkesbury River area of New South Wales, introduced in 1810. Uh, fairly familiar to us now, things like you had to submit a plan of your dwelling to the local commissioner. Uh, there were minimum room heights and you had to build your chimneys out of stone. You couldn't build them out of wood anymore. Um, but they were relatively localised around six or seven towns. Sydney proper got its first building regulations in 1837. And again, those regulations were really a transplantation of the London Building Act, originally of 1666, after the Great Fire of London, and then re, um, revisited and redone by the English um, in 1774. And so just the same decade of the discovery of Australia by the English. And so you can see here 1837 and Gladesville 1838. So quite similar time frames for our building regulations and our lunatic asylums. Here in Victoria, the same century, Yarra Bend Asylum, which is about two or three kilometres from where we're standing now, 1848. The Q Asylum, which is an important one, as we'll see later on, started in 1856. It too was modelled on the 1851 Colney Hatch Asylum in London. Um, <clears throat> Victoria is a little bit further behind New South Wales, but um, it's easy for us Victorians to forget that it wasn't until 1851 that Victoria became its own state. Up until then, we were part of New South Wales. So originally the Yarra Bend Asylum was actually administered by the Gladesfield Asylum in Sydney. And again, building regulations in Melbourne, 1849. So again, just a couple of years before we started building asylums here. If we scoop forward a little bit uh, to the 1940s, <clears throat> we have a significant increase in the recognition of disability here in Australia um, and a bit of a change of the model from the old charity model, which we've been talking about with asylums, where people were um, you know, essentially given to an institution and you walked away and you never talked to them again. Um, more of a recognition of disability, particularly because of World War One and World War Two, so that's the 1940s, uh, and a move from that charity model of um, disability to what they called a medical model of disability, which basically said, well, there's something wrong with you, but with science we can fix it or we can moderate it, yeah? But it was still very much an institutional model. It just now turned into more like a hospital medical institutional model rather than a kind of convent or home for people with disabilities where they were locked up and left alone. Um, it was also um, in the 1940s in Australia, a really large house building program, again, to accommodate returned soldiers after the Second World War. And as part of that, the introduction of first, what we call uniform building regulations. So the first sort of in Victoria, uniform set of building regulations. But at that stage in, the 19, in 1945, it was voluntary for the local councils to implement those. So they were there, but they weren't um, compulsory. We move forward again a couple of decades. Now we're in the 1970s. And here there's a move to deinstitutionalize people with disabilities and to house them in the community. Yeah. So they were housed in what they were known as um, community residential units, CRUs, or group homes, they're often called as well. We still have over a thousand of those group homes in Victoria at the moment. Um, and there they were still institutional, but they're much smaller scale. So here we like 
four, five, six, seven guys. Oh, you've all got Down syndrome. You guys all go live in this one building, yeah, and we'll look after you. And it was all run by the government. So that was happening. It was a move away from that medical model to what was called a social model of disability. So it was a move to try and get people back into the community. Yeah. So, but they still had a very institutional lifestyle, even though they were living in small groups of five or six. Yeah. Because they would all go on Tuesday, you go bowling. Uh, on Wednesday, we have pasta for dinner. So it was all very structured and organized, but it was a much smaller scale than the large scale institutions of the century before. Also, in this uh, decade, in the 70s and 1974, the uniform building regulations stopped being optional and became mandatory. So now every council in Victoria needed to apply the universal building regulations. That was state-based, yeah, so just here in Victoria. Now we move to the 90s. Quite a lot happened in the 90s. So <clears throat> the Building Code of Australia, so not state-based anymore, but now a national building code, the National Construction Code, um, first edition, 1988, second edition in 1990. The people who put that together, the precursors of the current um, Australian Building Control Board, um, contracted uh, a group of construction lawyers to put together what they call the Model Building Act in order to standardise building legislation around Australia. That led in 1993 to Victoria largely accepting the Model Building Act um, and incorporating our current Building Act here in Victoria. In between that, Model Building Act 1991 and Building Act 1993, the Disability Discrimination Act was enacted at the Commonwealth level. So we have a Commonwealth level discrimination act, that, so you can't discriminate against people with a disability. What happened then, a few years later, the Q Cottages, the original Q Asylum, had been scaled down and was being used as a series of um, residential units of 10, 15, 20 people. One of the residents set one of those on fire um, and seven or eight of the residents there were killed. Um, it was quite a traumatic um, episode in Victoria. Uh, a lot of blame on the government that these were vulnerable people and they weren't being protected. Um, and so the issue of disability and housing and fire safety became very, very much entwined here in Victoria. Move in to the last 20 years, so from 2000 up until 2020. Um, 2006, we have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with a Disability, to which Australia is a signature and has ratified that, so we're under obligation. And all through that time, through the 90s and into the 2000s, even as our building regulations were being nationalised and kind of crystallised out into one thing rather than a whole pile of things, our, our way of dealing with people with a disability had moved away from that social model into what's known as a person-centred model of disability that points to a choice and control for the individuals with that disability to the best of their ability to do that. So that's starting to sort of, you know, distance itself from how we deal with it in the building regulations. 2011, we get some legislation called access to premises legislation, actually not in the building code, which is kind of strange, but it is an Australian standard and that applies to all public buildings. So RMIT, for example, swimming pools, local councils, the library, that mandates that people with um, disabilities be able to access those buildings, but they don't um, apply to individual houses. To people, personal residences do not have to um, do not have to conform to the access to premises legislation. And then, in a really major, major shakeup of how we deal with disability in Australia, the National Disability uh, Insurance Scheme, the NDIS, was rolled out gradually from 2014 to 2019, and that also contained a housing element of it, a small part of the program, but large enough. Um, to deal with building houses for people with a disability. Okay, so why does all this matter? What's the point of going through all this history? Well, it matters on a number of things and we're nowhere near enough time to discuss them all, but one of the most important is building classification. Every building in Australia that's built needs to be classified according to its use. That building classification then triggers all of the regulations you need to conform with according to that building. Because clearly regulation is different if I'm building a house 
or a school or a warehouse or an airport. And so the building classification is a really important thing. And this is probably the biggest area where we have diverged from community expectations for people with a disability and the building regulations. An ordinary domestic house is a class 1A building here in Australia and it has a whole series of regulations to go around it. A class three building is an institutional building like a hotel, for example, or something along those lines. The only place in the building regulations where people with a disability is mentioned is in class three. So that means that our community expectation and the explicit aim of our government is to allow people to live wherever they want in the community, but anyone with a disability is in theory in the building regulations expected to live in a class three building, the equivalent of a hotel. What that does is it brings in a whole range of things. There's an example in the photo there, that's a one bedroom little unit with a carer's room on the side that was classified as a class three building because it was designed for someone with a disability, which means it needs to have that great big car park out the front. You see those dashed yellow lines. It needs to have a full sprinkler system. It needs to have a whole range of exit signs around the door, things that make it look very institutional rather than a home, even though it's a one bedroom unit. So you get these things that happen. Fire safety, as I mentioned, quite a traumatic thing in 1996 in Victoria. And so all Victorian dwellings done by the government for people with a disability have been classified as a class three, regardless of what they are. Um, and it's only recently, two years ago, that the a domestic sprinkler system was introduced into the National Construction Code, which allows more options for a class one dwelling to have a domestic sprinkler system in it and not necessarily have the full um, sprinklers required for class three. The issue there is that they cost a lot of money and the houses become unaffordable and unviable for developers to develop. Okay, so just going back to the original question and to sort of to wrap up, can regulations respond? Well, they can, but very, very slowly, it appears. It's quite a hurdle. There's been, um, you know, probably 15 years of agitation in Australia in order to get the accessibility provisions um, applied to domestic houses. That's happened. And so the next National Construction Code, the one that comes out this year, will include and accessible um, features for all new houses to be built. And in our opinion, it's the first piece of building legislation, building regulation that actually conforms to a person-centered idea of disability rather than an, the old institutional ideas. There's a role here for building surveyors as they classify buildings and as they look at them um, in navigating the uncertainty that we have. And finally, there's this issue of, well, how much protection does someone with a disability actually require? Where do you draw the line between having something that looks like a home and having something that's completely safe? And how do you define what we call the dignity of risk for people? Yeah, which is a very, very vexed question in itself and not one that building regulations deal with particularly well. Um, so I will end it there. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, oh, there we are. Uh, so this is pretty weird. Does anyone have any questions for me? Any in the chat box? No. <laughs> you don't have to, but if you've got a question, I'm happy to answer it. You have too many questions. Sorry, I only can ask one. <laughs> I think it's a very good example that the uh, building regulation constantly changing and how our building going to react on it, especially the existing building. So this is the uh, open buildings. Uh, try to dealing with this kind of changing things, you know, changing. So it's very much related to our topic. So thanks a lot. But just ask you, uh, I want to ask oh, how to do the existing building. Like, for instance, uh, I have a normal uh, uh, house, but suddenly I get handicapped. So I do I need to change all the fire sprinklers and uh, all such things now, or I have to move to the institutions in order to be safe? Look, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, 
up until the rollout of the NDIS, um, most all states in Australia had their own programs, what they call home modification programs, which are, are common programs in, in many countries. And so those are programs where you can get assistance from the government, <coughs> financial assistance to modify your home in case, if you need it because you've, you've had a motorbike accident and now you're quadriplegic, or even if you've just you know, you're 80 years old now and, and your home doesn't work for you as well as it used to and you need to make modifications. Those modifications were shifted to the NDIS, which is a national scheme uh, yeah. in 2019. <coughs> Excuse me. And there is a home modification program, but it's not particularly effective. And so we find we still, the issue is that people, particularly people who have accidents um, and end up with a pretty severe disability uh, end up spending time in hospitals longer than they need to be because there's nowhere for them to go. Or um, in, a, in Australia, the case has been that people have ended up, younger people uh, mm-hmm. have ended up in old age care facilities because it's the only place that's available where they can get 24-7 nurse assistance, for example. So clearly uh, a really unacceptable situation to have an 18-year-old in an old age care facility. But the, quest, the, the problem is the amount of appropriate places to live in Australia if you've got a disability. And that that's the challenge to encourage the private sector to to build that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. I'm not sure that we have our final presenter who um, was meant to be here, but is not here or online. Um, and so we may have gained 10 minutes because um, we're not sure where Sasha is. Has any question, we're not sitting on any questions, no? Um, well, maybe I'm and appreciating that it's late in the day and I'm not sure how late it is in, in China, but certainly it's late here um, or late-ish in the afternoon in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. If anyone has any questions um, for any of the presenters that are still with us, then by all means, um, is there anybody? Nope. Okay. Um, can I thank, um, as chair, Nobuhiro, thank you very much. Um, and to the other presenters as well, uh, Ling Xiang and, and Peng Li, thank you very much for the presentations today. They were really, really good. Uh, we really appreciate it. Also, uh, she can't hear us, but Shan Chen as well. Um, yes, did you want to say something? No, um, when you Jen? finish, I just oh. want to uh, thank for everyone for joining this conference. You know. but, but you go on, you are going on. That's fine. And I, I, for those of you um, not wanting to forget who've joined us online, thank you very, very much for that. It, um, it, it's uh, great that we're able to get not just the people here in Melbourne, but to people all over the world, um, and particularly people I suspect in, in, in China and Japan, who seem to have a really big contribution to both this panel and the panel beforehand. So thank you very much um, for that. And with that, I can let you guys go for the rest of your day. Um, thanks very much. Thank